What factors are taken into consideration when determining child custody? Everything. I mean, honestly, Raina, that is the easiest. People ask us that question every day in my office. And the easiest answer is everything. The court is going to look at all parts of each parent. You can, you know, they're the more obvious ones. Where do the parents live? What are the living arrangements? Do the children have a bedroom? Is there room for the children? How close do the parents live to each other? Work schedules of the parents. Can Do the parents have the ability to get the child to and from school? Do the parents have the ability to feed the child dinner and help do homework and get the child to bed at a reasonable time? If you're a parent listening to this and you're working second shift, you're not gonna get very many weeknights because you can't get the child from school and you can't get the child to bed. Welcome to another episode of Best of Johnston County, brought to you by Breeden Law Office. Our host, Jonathan Breeden, an experienced family lawyer with a deep connection to the community, is ready to take you on a journey through the area that he has called home for over 20 years. Whether it's a deep dive into the love locals have for the county or unraveling the complexities of family law, Best of Johnston County presents an authentic slice of this unique community. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Best of Johnston County podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Breeden. And today we're having a special edition episode of the Best of Johnson County podcast called Ask Jonathan Breeden Anything. If you follow this podcast regularly, we have two different types of episodes on this podcast. The episodes that we do most commonly where I, Jonathan Breeden, interview interesting people from the community, whether it be county commissioners, sports coaches, other small business owners about what they do and what they love about Johnson County. And we have these special edition episodes of the Best of Johnson County podcast where I am asked a series of questions about family law matters, which is what we do here at the Breed Law Office, and I attempt to answer them as best I can. So this is one of the special edition episodes where I'm going to attempt to answer the questions from Raina Birch, our social media coordinator. Are you ready, Raina? I hope so. All right, let's see. I think I know the answers to these, but since I don't know what the questions are, I'm not promising. Well, I mean, you're batting 10 out of 10 so far. So, all right, first question. What are the different types of child custody? Okay, there are two different types of child custody in North Carolina. There is legal custody and there is physical custody. And I do think that a lot of people don't realize that. And they come in and say, I want sole custody. What does sole custody mean, right? So when we think about custody, it's really the two types. There's physical custody and legal custody. I'll start with physical custody. And that is literally physically, where are the children each day? Are they at dad's house? Are they at mom's house? Is it 50-50? Is it week on week off? Is it 50-50 where it's sort of a 2-2-3 type situation where it's Monday, Tuesday at mom's, Wednesday, Thursdays at dad's, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at mom, and it just sort of keeps rotating in a 2-2-3 manner. There's also 50-50, which we call 2-2-5-5, where it's every Monday, Tuesday at mom's house, every Wednesday, Thursday at dad's house, and then every other weekend. And in that situation, the weekend attaches to the weekdays, which leads to a five-day period. So over a two-day period, it'd be Monday at mom's, Tuesday at mom's, Wednesday at dad's, Thursday at dad's, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday with mom, then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with dad. And so those are the three, of course, common types of shared 50-50 physical custody. And then, of course, there's every other weekend and all of that type of stuff. So physical custody is literally where they are. If you have roughly equal amounts or where one side has, it, the side that has the fewest has at least 12 nights a month, to me, that is a joint physical custody situation, even if it is not exactly 50-50. Usually about 10 nights a month. I think anything more than 10 is joint physical, even though it's not 50-50. Um, legal custody is the ability to make decisions and have access to school records, medical records, religious decisions, the changing of the outward appearance of the child. Those are the things that would cover legal custody. So does the child go to public school? Does the child go to private school? Is the child homeschooled? 
These are all parts of legal custody. Also, where does the child go to the doctor? What vaccines the child receives? Not all people agree on what the vaccine should be. And also, should the child receive any type of medical care? Some parents disagree on whether a child should have COVID vaccine. Some parents have religious beliefs about certain types of medical care. So that is part of joint legal custody. And then access to the providers and access to their records. And so in a joint legal custody situation, which is the overwhelming vast majority of all cases in North Carolina, when you're thinking about joint legal custody, the parties should endeavor to agree. They should discuss it and they should agree. If they cannot agree, then they have the option, if they have a court order that gives them joint legal custody, of going to the court and asking the judge to make a decision as to what it should be. Or sometimes the courts in a joint legal situation give one parent final decision-making authority after they've discussed it with the other parent. And that is still considered joint legal, even though if you're the one that doesn't have final decision-making, it's not going to feel very joint to you. And then some judges in court orders, if they order joint legal, say if the parties cannot agree, they should follow the recommendation of the doctor or the education provider as to whatever it is. If the doctor says the child needs to have this surgery, if the parties can't agree and the order says you do what the provider says, then the child would have the surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's legal custody. And I think it's very important for both parents to be I believe that joint physical custody in almost all situations is best for children, as I believe that joint legal custody is best in almost all situations for children because it keeps both parents involved and they have different perspectives. I've seen even, you know, I'm married, so I'm not divorced, but, you know, my wife and I don't always agree on the education decision for our kids, but I think we both make better decisions by discussing it with each other and coming to a decision based on, I might see it one way, she might see it the other. And I think both parents should be involved. So there are two types of custody, physical and legal. Yeah, I believe in the same thing. I think it's best to look at all options. And obviously if you've got two different people bringing different options to the table, I think that's best for everybody. Correct. All right, number two, in your experience, do family court judges show preference to one parent over the other? And why do you think if that the answer is yes, why? I don't believe they do in general. You know, just walk into any family court in North Carolina, particularly in the counties we practice primarily in Johnson, Harnett, and Wake. I do not believe the judges have a predetermined disposition to be more in favor of mom than they do dad. Now, that has changed. As the judges have changed over the 23, 24 years I've been in these counties, it has changed. When I got here, there was a pre-thought that mom was better. And I think we saw that. But as the judges have changed over now, basically a generation, 20 years of me or more of me practicing law here, and the judges that I started with are now my parents' age, 75, 76, you know, 80 years old, you know, they had one view of the family. But now that the judges are largely in their 40s and early 50s, and some even in their 30s, particularly in Wake County, you know, the family dynamic has changed. You know, mm -hmm. women have been working outside the home a lot more mm -hmm. in the last 30 or 40 years. And a lot of these judges now grew up with dads that were very involved and that moms that worked. And, you know, and judges come looking at it, they go back to really kind of how they were raised, right? I mean, family law is the best interest of the child. It's whatever the judge wants to do that they can reasonably justify in an opinion that they think is best. And they're going to come in with kind of how they were. And that's why you should take district court judge elections, which are going on here in 2024, seriously, because those are the people out there making custody decisions and they are elected and they go to the voters and they say, this is my background and this is my education, training, and experience. And I think I would be a fair and impartial judge. And that's who gets elected. And they try to do that. But I think now with the current crop of judges who have seen their fathers be way more involved in the day-to-day -day than maybe the fathers of raising kids in the 1960s, yeah. I think it's become easier. And we have more female judges who 
by the fact that they're a female judge are working moms and they see what their husbands provide and how much they have to do because it's a ton of work to be a judge. And so I think it's made it a more even playing field subconsciously. The law has always been the same, but I believe subconsciously has become a more even playing field and you see much more joint physical situations. And you also see more dads win custody when the mom, you know, is not good and it's not best for the children. And so I don't think judges now have any kind of preconceived notions. I think they look at the cases as the facts. Do they sometimes maybe rely too much on what the parties have been doing? Yes, maybe sometimes, but, and oftentimes that might be that the mom has had more than the dad. But I think, you know, a case presented properly, if you can show it's in the best interest of the child, that it should be joint or that the father should have primary. I don't think judges have a problem doing that now. So I think there's a lot of people that think, well, the mom's always going to win. And that's just not the case. Yeah, I think now they definitely kind of start at their mindset is start at 50-50 Correct. and work your way on either side from there instead of starting over here. And you have to convince me to not be over here Correct. anymore. So. Correct. That's been my experience, particularly especially over the last 10 years. Yeah. All right, three, what factors are taken into consideration when determining child custody? Everything. I mean, that's the easiest, honestly, right now, that is the easiest. People ask us that question every day in my office. And the easiest answer is everything. The court is going to look at all parts of each parent. You can, you know, they're the more obvious ones. Where do the parents live? What are the living arrangements? Do the children have a bedroom? Is there room for the children? How close do the parents live to each other? Work schedules of the parents. Do the parents have the ability to get the child to and from school? Do the parents have the ability to, you know, feed the child dinner and help do homework and get the child to bed at a reasonable time? If you're a parent listening to this and you're working second shift, you're not going to get very many weeknights because you can't get the child from school and you can't get the child to bed. If you're a parent listening to this and you work third shift almost exclusively, it's going to be a hard time having the child overnight during the week because you're not there. And the court is going to choose the other parent over your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your mom or whatever. If it can have the child of a parent, that's what it's going to do. And the court has to consider whether either or both parents have drug or alcohol problems and how that may affect their ability to parent the child and be present for the child and make good decisions for the child. The courts are going to look at the people's financial ability to be able to provide for the child and make sure that the child has food and clothing and roof and heating and air and stuff like that. The courts are going to look at the people in the parents' households and are these good people that should be around the children having significant relationship with the children. They're going to look at how many people are in the household. Yeah. Are there 10 or 11 people in a house? And who are these people? And why are there 10 or 11 people living there? And sometimes that is a budgetary thing to make it possible for everybody to be able to provide for their own families. But is that best for this child to be sharing a small house or apartment with 10 or 11 people? If there's another house where there's not 10 or 11 people and who are these 10 or 11 people and what relationship do they have to the child? And do these people have criminal records yeah. and stuff like that? So the court's going to look at that. The court's going to also look at transportation. Do the parents have valid driver's license? Do they have working vehicles? Do they have an ability to get the child to and from school, to and from any extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. stuff like that? So really it is everything. I mean, they're looking at all parts of being a parent. And it's not that if one side has more money that they're going to win. It's not that. It's not to the richest person gets primary custody, but each person does have to be able to provide for sort of the minimum needs of the child and be able to be there for the child, both emotionally and physically and financially. And, you know, if you're a parent that has to get up at three or 4 a.m. for work, you're not going to get a lot of weekday time because the court's not going to support, you know, the child being left with somebody else to get them up bed, fed, babe to school on time. Or I mean, that's left alone, completely left alone, completely correct. On the bus, correct. And, you know, can't expect a nine year old to get themselves up and out of the house and on the bus, correct. on the bus on time and to and from school. And right. And so if you are a parent that has, you know, one of these schedules, you know, 
having family members that you can stay with can be helpful. You know, a lot of schools have before school care and some daycares have before school care as well, as long with after school care. I mean, people have to work and do what they have to do, but you have to be thinking, you know, if I am now the primary parent and if you're in a divorce or separation situation, you're going to be a primary parent when you have the child, you have to be able to provide for the child as if you were the only parent. And the court is going to look at, okay, when you have the child, what is your plan? You know, who is getting the child to school? Who is getting the homework done? Who is feeding the child dinner? Who is putting the child to bed? What time is the child going to bed? What bed is the child sleeping in? So everything is considered in a child custody case. Okay. Have family law questions? Need guidance to navigate legal challenges? The compassionate team at Breeden Law Office is here to help. Visit us at www.breedenfirm.com for practical advice, resources, or to book a consultation. Remember, when life gets messy, you don't have to face it alone. Four, can modifications be made to child custody order? How would somebody do that and why? Yes, a modification can be made to a child custody order by filing a motion to modify a child custody order. If it is a temporary child custody order and it is less than a year old, and this is not written in the statute, but it's unwritten rule that came out of a court of appeals case a few years ago. And it says a temporary order remains temporary until it is reviewed or unless it has been more than a year and nobody has made any effort Mm -hmm. to set it for permanent custody. Or if a judge determines that it is a permanent order by the way it is written. One way they look at that is it could be two years. And if it doesn't address holidays and summers, they often will not say that's a permanent order because a temporary order only addressed weekends, something like that. But as a general rule, a temporary order can be reviewed. In Johnson, Hart and Wake County, it's going to be hard to get a review hearing within a year. But as long as you're attempting to get a review hearing, a temporary order stays temporary until you have a permanent custody trial whenever that is. And at that time, the court can change the temporary order however it wants and doesn't have to make any substantial findings. It just has to find what's in the best interest of the child. If you have a permanent custody order or a temporary order that's more than a year old that nobody's attempted to review, then you have a permanent custody order. To modify a permanent custody order, the moving party has to be able to allege and prove by clear, cogent, and convincing evidence that there has been a substantial change in circumstances that affects the welfare of the minor child that now makes that the current custody order in not in the child's best interest. And so things that can be a substantial change in circumstances, the parents have moved and they no longer live close enough to each other or they're going to move to where they're going to be more than 20 or 25 miles apart, which makes 50-50 just about impossible. One parent has gotten a DWI or developed a drug problem and are no longer able to properly supervise the child. One parent has decided they are going to live with or marry a convicted felon or somebody who's on the sex offender registry. Another substantial change we saw recently, the child has been disciplined inappropriately Mm -hmm. to where they are leaving marks and bruises on the child in the discipline that they are doing. And sometimes we get where a parent just abandons a child, Mm -hmm. where there is some sort of custody schedule, joint or not, and the parent has decided they're not going to participate with this child anymore, and they have gone away and they're not participating. So these are all sort of substantial changes that we have seen. This is in the last few weeks here Mm -hmm. in my office that would allow a permanent order to probably be modified, taken to a judge. Things that courts often do not find to be substantial changes. Let's say you're a parent who had a drug or alcohol problem and a grandparent or the other parent ended up getting primary custody and you got very limited visitation, if any at all. And just because you now are sober does not mean that there's been a substantial change that affects the child per se. If the child is doing fine in whatever home they're in, you know, that's something that I think people can be a little surprised by because it really is, it has to affect the child. And I encourage all parents to get better, particularly if you weren't better and you had some issues that you needed to address and you've addressed them. But 
you cannot just assume because you addressed your issues, if the child is doing fine where they are, that the court may say that's not a substantial change. Well, yeah, and I mean, no parent's perfect, but we can always strive to be better for our kids. Correct. And I'm talking about in that situation where your time was curtailed a lot or maybe completely because you had a drug or alcohol problem and now you're getting clean and those types of things. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's all, like I said, back to the first question. Everything is sort of included. All things are being considered. And that's just kind of how the courts go about doing it. But in order to modify a permanent custody order, you have to file a motion to modify and you have to allege and prove a substantial change in circumstances that affects the welfare of the minor child. And you need to be very clear about how whatever has changed is affecting the child and not just the parent. Yes. Okay. And just a quick follow-up. So when you say, you know, if one parent is basically elected to stop participating in their visitation time or their time with the kid, is there a time frame that you can be like, you know, they, six months, a year, is there a general? I mean, there's not a set rule. I would say if they've stopped participating for four or five, six months, I think that shows a pattern. Yeah. That's not what they want to do. You know, what is frustrating if you're the parent who has a parent who has stopped participating and why you should file a motion to modify is that order that gives that parent every other weekend or whatever it is, is still in effect until there's an order that says it's not. Yeah. And what is frustrating to us and our clients is if we represent the mom and the dad has decided not to visit for three months and then he shows back up and says, I want this weekend and the mom's already planned something okay. else yeah. because he hasn't been there for three months. That's frustrating to the parent. That's frustrating to the child as yeah. well. And that's why if you have somebody who stopped participating, who's not visiting consistently, you should file a motion to modify and get the order modified so they can't try to got you visit with their kid. That's not best for the parent and it's for sure not best for the child. Okay. All right. Last question. Can a child express preference in child custody matters? And is there a minimum age for that? The answer is yes and no. A child may state a preference and no, there is not a minimum age. I think the standard thought out there in the world is when the child is 12, they can pick who they want to live with. And that is not the law. And that is not how things are often going to go. The courts are willing to listen to any witness that a party may want to call, including a child, as long as that witness knows the difference between a truth and a lie and can tell the judge that they know the difference between a truth and a lie and is mature enough to state an opinion that is their own and not one that is coerced or bribed mm. or, and I got tons of stories. I mean, we, oh, can, do, no <laughs> we can do 10 podcasts, Raina, on kids who have sort of been, you know, coached up, you know, and all you got to do is go in there and tell this judge these five things. And there's a new iPhone waiting for you when you walk out of there, you know, and the kids come in there and they're ready to go. But the thing is they're kids and a good lawyer, like the lawyers that bring law office, within about three questions are going to have this kid so confused that they're not going to be able to get their story straight because what they've been pumped up to say is not actually the truth yeah. and they don't know how to handle it once, you know, and that's the part is they say, well, I'm going to take the kid in there and I don't get the kid to go in there and say they never want to see their father again. Well, okay, you can do that. But the father's attorney is going to get to ask that kid questions and find a basis for that opinion. Mm-hmm. And, Oftentimes, the basis of that opinion is not very deep, mm-hmm. other than my mom kind of told me to come in here and say this, yeah. and you know, the court's going to see right through that. So, ultimately, and the reason that children don't get to pick, right? Some judges will not listen to children, okay? And it is in the judge's sole discretion as to who they allow to be the witness in their courtroom at any time. They can accept or deny any witness at any time for any reason. Most judges, if you want to bring a child, that's at least eight or nine is willing to listen to what the child has to say. I do not know how much weight they actually give to the child. I think in some situations, particularly as children get older, they may give more weight to it, particularly if it's a well-reasoned decision, one that makes sense. They've not been sort of propped up to go in there and 
say the other parent who hates the other parent's talking points, you know, if they've got legitimate concerns about, we had one a couple of weeks ago where we had four children and they were between the ages of nine and 15 and their father had developed a drinking problem. And they could clearly come in and tell that judge that their father was drinking too much and that they were scared and that kind of stuff. So that part, yes, absolutely be considered. These children love their father. They want to see him get help but they're scared when he's drinking. Yeah. And they came and told that judge that. And as a result, that father, his time has been limited. He's going to have to go get some treatment. And if he does those things, I think the court will be open to giving him more time. So, you know, it depends on kind of what they're saying. But no, they do not get the absolute right to decide where they're going to live because they don't know what's best for them. Yeah. They're minors. And they may very well, and I've seen this a lot of times, want to go with the parent that's got the least rules that lets mm -hmm. them be on TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat all the time. The ones that let them go on car dates when one parent might. The one, the parent, I did one one time where they wanted to go with the other parent because that mom basically let them party and drink alcohol and dress and all goth and paint their faces white. And that was not best for that child where you had a more disciplined father, a stricter father, and the court thought that his way of doing it and the court understood why the child wanted to go with the mom. Who wouldn't want to go to a mom that allowed you to party and drink alcohol and, you know, have piercings in your nose and be golfed and all of that kind of stuff, which is fine. I'm not passing judgment on that. But I think that judge decided that being that way was not best for that child and gave custody to the father. And so... You know, that's the thing. So, I mean, the judges are going to do what they think is best. But, you know, if kids get older and they, you know, and the thing we see a lot of is if you've got a situation where one parent does not have 50-50 or does not have substantial time when the children are little and now they've gotten older and they've gotten to be sort of teenagers and they would like to spend more time with the other parent, you know, before they go off to college and the other parent is not you know, I always use the word axe murderer, like is, is a decent person, yeah. you know, has a, lives in the area, has a work schedule that works, can financially provide all the things going back to question two that we were talking about. What's, you know, what does the court consider everything? Yeah. Then the court more than likely, like, you know what, this, I can see why the child wants to do this. It makes sense. This parent seems like a pretty good person. Why don't we give that parent some more time because that's what the child's asking for and that's what's best for the child. So once again, there are no hard written rules here. And you know, this is not math and I wasn't great in math. I mean, this literally is whatever the person wearing the black robe decides, you, you know, we learn those judges, we're in front of them, the Breed Law Office every week, we begin to learn their preferences. We know them from when they were lawyers and some of them are friends of ours. And so we know, what makes them tick and what they like and what they don't like. And we do try to tailor our cases and present things that we know these judges like. Some judges really don't like people who use any drug, including marijuana. Some judges don't have any problem with a parent using marijuana. Well, it's important to know that when you go yeah. in there, if you've got a case where one or both parents is using marijuana, marijuana is now legal in 30 states or something, but it's not legal in North Carolina and it's not going to be legal anytime soon. Some judges have a problem with that. Some judges do not. That's where it's important that you hire lawyers and law firms that are routinely in these courts that know these judges, that know what they're looking for, because the judge can do really anything they want to do. And it's very important to have that sort of knowledge. So if you've got a case in Johnston Harnett County, you really should have a Johnston Harnett County attorney because they're going to know those judges way better than any of these attorneys coming from Wake County would because you're there every day and you know them and most of them you've known for a very long time. You've been practicing law here. I've known every judge we have for 20 years or more. I mean, so I know kind of what makes them tick. I know the kind of evidence that they're going to be receptive to and that's the kind of evidence we go and present the best case for our clients. So that's all stuff to keep in mind as you prepare for your case, go through your case. Okay. I think that's all I got. For that's today. all you have for today. Okay. Well, cool. <laughs> well, anyway, I hope you listeners got a good value out of the special edition of the best of Johnson County podcast. Ask Jonathan Breeden anything. We'll thank Raina for her help here today with 
putting the questions together. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the legal topics we talked about today, whether it be about child custody and what could be good for you or your family or you want to expound on it, give us a call here at the Breen Law Office at 919-661-4970. Is your first time listening to the Best of Johnson County podcast? Feel free to continue to listen. New episodes come out every Monday. We ask that you like, subscribe, or follow this podcast wherever you're seeing it on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or you're seeing any of the social media clips on TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook that we put out every day of the week. New episodes come out every Monday, and most of the episodes, as we stated earlier, are me, Jonathan Breeden, interviewing interesting people from the Johnson County community about what they love about Johnson County as much as I do. So go back, listen to some of those episodes, tune in next week for future episodes, and until next time, I'm your host, Jonathan Breeden. That's the end of today's episode of Best of Johnston County, a show brought to you by the trusted team at Breeden Law Office. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to sharing more interesting facets of this community next week. Every story, every viewpoint adds another thread to the rich tapestry of Johnston County. If the legal aspects highlighted raise some questions, help is just around the corner at www.breedenfirm.com.